welcome to another episode of the Outside Insider Podcast here on Philly Sports Network with myself, Liam Jenkins. What a game it was on Monday night. The Eagles take care of business, 28-13 win over the Washington Redskins. They're in control of their own destiny, kind of. We're going to break down everything from the Monday night matchup, including what was right, what went wrong, and so much more. But before we get into it, don't forget, if you're not listening to this on Apple Podcasts, there is a link in the description. If you tap on that, it's absolutely free to do so. It takes you five seconds. Hit that subscribe button if you enjoy the show. It is the best way to show your support for this content. If you're not on Apple Podcasts, don't worry, Spotify is coming. And if you still don't like that, then hitting that subscribe button on YouTube really does mean the world to me. We're trying to get to 5,000 by Christmas. So that's the aim, but we need you guys to make it a game. And that is the worst rhyme that I've ever come up with. So I'd actually unsubscribe at this point. <laughs> uh, we're going to go straight into things. So guys, thank you so much for all of your support recently. It's been so, so cool seeing this podcast grow. And um, I think actually being able to put my personality into it a bit more has been a lot more fun. And I think that you guys are enjoying that part as well. So straight into the game, what was the big takeaway? Firstly, Carson Wentz, we have to start with the elephant in the room, right? Because for some reason, Carson Wentz has now become the most polarising athlete on this Eagles team. And it's really strange to me, because if we arrived a year ago, just 12 months beforehand, if Carson Wentz had maybe made a slight error, an error of judgement, an interception, maybe overthrew a wide receiver, maybe missed a wide open target, Ah, don't worry, boys. He'll, he'll get there. He's only young. It's his second year. We've got him on a five. It'll be fine. Don't worry. Carton's come in. Look at what he did before, though. Look, he's running round. He can do that, so he'll be fine. Everything is fine. It's one throw. Don't worry. Now, if Carson Wentz makes a mistake, it's, oh, my God, the sky's falling down. I don't know what to do with myself. Please help. Help. This is all going wrong. Um, my, my oven's burning, I can't eat properly because it's all just black because I've burnt it, um, I've spilt drink down myself because I'm too busy getting angry, and my wife just left me. Just relax. I've been the first to admit that Carson Wentz has not been his usual self, and there are a million reasons for that, and I feel like at this stage, I'm breaking them down every single week religiously. Whether it is the fact that an ACL takes around two years to fully recover from, to get that mobility back. Well, you know, are you expecting him to run round like a, a Jaguar on acid after he's just torn an ACL and an MCL? Like, it doesn't work like that. It takes time. He somehow gets back ready for week three. Just look at what Sam Bradford did in his career when he was torn up by an ACL. It takes a while. So Carson Wentz comes back. Into the fray. Just to briefly summarise, if you're new to the show, why Carson Wentz is struggling. Comes back to the team that for the last seven, eight months, you know, you've got from week 14 to the Super Bowl, the off-season, the pre-season, has been predicated on Nick Foles. The receivers are used to his timing, to his rhythm, yada, yada, yada. Carson Wentz comes back, different change of game. Again, most important relationship on the team. It's a quarterback to offensive coordinator. And Frank Reich just magically disappeared and he's stroking Andrew Luck's beard. Another rhyme for you. So it takes time to get used to that. And then you've got the ACL. And then you've got the fact there's no run game. And then you've got the fact the Eagles are choking away and they can't hold on to leads. And the defense is atrocious. So Wentz is putting more pressure on himself. And those rookie errors are coming out of the woodwork. Now what I've seen consistently in the last few weeks is that They're not going away. His footwork is very static. It is like he's stuck in the mud in the pocket. Like someone has just super glued his cleats to the floor or something. And now he's still staring receivers down. That's exactly what happened on the old Sean Jeffrey read. I don't care if that ball was tipped or not. Even if it wasn't, I think Josh Norman would have got it. Because with inside, I reckon, three steps of that route. Jeffrey didn't have separation. Wentz just slinged it. Slung it? Sling it? Slung it? I should be better than that. I'm a journalist. Come on, Liam. Keep it up. When Jordan Matthews actually had a step on the guy about two yards away. Instead of trying to go over the top, where Jeffrey was originally running a bit deeper into the end zone, he just threw it to the front. And it kind of just didn't end well. And then, of course, there was the weird pass where he missed a wide-open Nelson Aguilar, where I'm pretty sure 
if Aguilar had caught that pass and Wentz was on target, Aguilar would have made it to England by now, running that ball, and we're having a nice cup of tea talking about what a dime it was. But then, the one thing I did see from Wentz last night was the ability to throw on the run. And that has been a large criticism this year for him. You see it wherever you go, whatever analyst you turn to, all we see these days is, ah, uh, Carson Wentz is wobbling around, he's not as good on the run, he's not as mobile. I just want to give a big shout out straight away to Michael Kist, who, through a combination of the NFL Next Gen Stats page, which is a great resource, and his own charting on the game, which I haven't got to yet, um, I'll get to my charting and film stuff tomorrow, there's a film room coming out, essentially worked out that Wentz went on the move or running around was 4 for 4 for 77 yards and a touchdown. Oh, he's really struggling on those bootlegs, isn't he? He's really not comfortable outside the pocket. <laughs> That's great form. That really is. It's very easy to nitpick Carson Wentz when the offence is misfiring as it has been. But do you realise if we did that in 2016, we would have been urging... Oh, I say we like I'm part of this, but I would have been trying to like battle the weird articles away. But I'm pretty sure I will name some unnamed beat writers here. Would be preaching, 10 reasons why the Eagles should train Carson Wentz or why Carson Wentz isn't the answer. There's no need to nitpick. Just because he's in his third season, it doesn't somehow have to magnify that glass. Now, I know it's easy to get lost when Jared Goff is doing Jared Goff things. Patrick Mahomes has somehow built an army tank onto his arm. And Drew Brees is tearing the league apart. As a veteran, you've got two ends of the spectrum, the young and the old. But none of those guys are coming back from what Carson Wentz has come back from in the adversity he's been in, without the playmakers he's missed with the injuries he's dealing with and the lack of relationship with an offensive coordinator that he's had. I keep using that analogy that it's like when you come back to work, there's a different manager and it takes time to adjust to things. I genuinely feel like at this point, if we, we change that analogy up a bit and we say you're in a mega famous rock band called, oh, I don't know, ZZ and the Slugs. What a rock name. What a great rock band name. Please never ever put me in charge of ZZ and the Slugs, all right? That is the band name we're going with. You're the guitarist in ZZ and the Slugs, okay? Your lead singer gets a bit of a chesty cough like Liam over it, gets a bit of bit of man flu in December. We all know what that's like. It's horrible. Puts you out of action for six weeks. Not like that. Dirty mind. I swear. Oh, dirty minded people. So you get a replacement singer in who sings a little bit higher. Not quite got the raspiness that ZZ has and he's... Classic band of Sluggington lyrics. But during that six month span that he's out, you go on tour and you, you kind of get used to that new front singer. He's actually kind of good at what he does and he puts his own spin on things. Maybe simplifies a few songs, hint, hint. And then your big man comes back, ZZ, with his big, long, roughly beard. And he walks into the building like, Oi, get out, sunshine, probably. And it takes a while to adjust back because you've spent six months touring with this guy, getting drunk with this guy, singing, playing, whatever. It takes a while. And the singer that's coming back from that chesty, chesty man flu infection, maybe his vocal cords aren't going to be as strong now. Maybe he's in a little bit of a bad way. It's going to take time to heat up. Just preach patience. It takes time. Carson Wentz, all things considered, coming back from an ACL is having a remarkable season. Yes, there are flaws in his game, there are mechanical flaws, which, as we've already learned in his career, can be very easily ironed out. There is no need to be picking week on week. Now, I know that's a little hypocritical because I've put the film room out more just to document why he's struggling, not just saying that he is and leaving it like so many do. I want to explain why, so we can understand that there's no real need to get so agitated and concerned. If this season has given you any reason to think that Carson Wentz is anything outside of a top 10 quarterback, then you're not watching football properly. Top 5 is debatable, I'd say massively. I mean, you're looking at this point, I would say around between 6 and 8 is where I would genuinely place him. How is that bad? Like, how is that? That's a quarterback that has literally ripped his ACL apart, had it, like, reconstructed. Come back a season later where everything's changed a little bit. The cohesion's not the same as that anonymous source came out and said. Went to have to put the team on his back. There's no run game. He's throwing 40 times a game despite the fact the team should be helping him out. 
and somehow he's putting up the stat line that he is. That's really good. Carson Wentz is the future of this football team. And if there is genuinely any reason of doubt about that after this year, then it's just not right. Again, guys, if you like this show, make sure you're hitting that subscribe button. Pound it like the Eagles are pounding the run because that's what we need. The more subscribers we get, the more cool things we can do for you. And I promise there is some exciting stuff in the pipeline. Talking of which, I know that one of your favourite segments on this show is a little something I like to call my workplace stories. Now, unfortunately, upon just saying that, it made me think of Thank You Next. And being off of a 4am night, well, it's 5am night, I beg your pardon, when I was up for work at 6, following the Eagles game, I kind of didn't have time to post up a Thank You Next tweet today. You know, I worked a nine-hour shift. I didn't have access to my phone. I was writing articles. So I'm really sorry I haven't got your questions included in this, this podcast. It's a bit emotional, I know. But I hope this story will make up for it because it comes with an analogy. And the, what I'm going to compare it to is the Boogermobile. You know, that lovely piece of machinery that ESPN beautifully crafted to ruin every Monday night football broadcast in existence for the foreseeable future. Like, I'm, I'm so thankful it's there. Because if Booger was not sat on top of that crane-looking Kinex thing, I wouldn't have a clue what's going on. Like, I, I still don't understand what insight he brings from the sideline as opposed to seeing it from about 24 yards away around the corner and a bit higher. What are we getting here? Is he going, ah, well, they might run the ball here. Well, I mean, I could have said that and I'm in England and it's 5am and I'm on three coffees and a lack of sleep. I don't need a mobile named, it's, it's called the Boogermobile. Like, he's, it's named after him. I wouldn't even call it that. I'll just call it giant metal demolition arm from my nightmares that's literally there to ruin my life. Or an ex-wife, as some of you may have. Badum, we're in with the jokes. Oh, you missed it. I know you did. That's that's great. Imagine just having a wife for starters. I love the next. Anyway, we're gonna uh, move on to this story. So the Boogermobile, as you may have known, isn't something I'm a big fan of because it's just useless. It obscures fans' views. He's sat up there with a nice cup of tea, watching the game. Like, while the rest of his team are inside, it's literally like he's the unpopular kid at school and they've just shoved him out there. Now, what I like in this too is that that lovely DIY store that I used to work in, we had a cleaner. Um, I'll probably name her because she won't know what a podcast is, if I'm brutally honest. So her name was Deb and she didn't know my name and I was there for around two years. And every morning she would come in and go, morning, Lee. And I'd be like, um, there's an um at the end of it, Lee, um. And she'd ask me to clock in for her because she didn't have her glasses on. And she didn't do anything. And she was on a full-time salary. All she would do is empty the bins, check the fire extinguishers haven't been stolen, and clean clean one aisle of the shop where it's just tiles on display. The, The rest of the shop looked like something out of Nagasaki. It looked like a bomb had hit it all the time. That one aisle, mwah, beautiful. Full time wage. Absolutely useless. Like, what does that benefit anyone? I mean, it got to a point I actually convinced her that the earth was flat. Um, that was a, a fun story. I just said that I watched some documentary on, made up some weird scientific phrasing, like, oh, because of the, um, the natural spherification of the earth, it appears to be spherical, but it's actually flat. And her response was, was that that Louis Theroux? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, he's good him. And off she went, trying to research why Louis Theroux said the earth was flat. But anyway, we got to a store meeting one day, and they were saying that they've got to cut back on hours and cut costs. And she was sat in the room, and I literally just said, can we not just not have a cleaner? And everyone looked so appalled and shocked, because she'd been there for years. And the manager got so upset with me and angry, and he was like, oh, how dare you say that, Liam? How how dare you say such a comment about Deb? She, She does loads of work. And I was like, I empty the bins half the time. And, and we have one clean aisle. Like, we have 12 in the store. What's the point? What does it add? You're just wasting money. That's the Boogermobile. The Boogermobile is Deb the Cleaner. Always remember that. Carry that with you through wherever you go in life. Just so that wherever you are, there's going to be a Boogermobile equivalent called Deb. But we've got to move on to a slightly more serious topic now. And that, that is that I still don't know what the Eagles defence is doing. Because for two weeks in a row, it has been the exact same situation. They start out absolutely appallingly. 
I mean, if Colt McCoy is sustaining drives, that's a problem. Something just wasn't right. And this defense, just, it's the same thing over and over and over again. Last week against the Giants, they gave up, what, I think it was 340 odd, 340, I want to say 346, but you have to quote me on that. Yards in the first half to the Giants, right? That was ridiculous. Now, I know a lot of them were from Saquon. Against the Redskins, they gave up 200. And 90 of them were on a touchdown to Adrian Peterson. Even if you take that away, I don't think you should be giving up 100 yards to Colt McCoy and a rushing attack that did literally nothing outside of that run. So the Eagles' defense did a good job of getting pressure, was getting a bit, you know, rusty in the end, got a bit more fired up, was playing with the passion and the fire that we've come to know and expect from this system. But there were still missing tackles. Sidney Jones was a culprit. It's twice it's happened this season. Russell Douglas was banned on a play. I believe there was a missed tackle by Nate Jerry before his interception. There are a couple of different incidents. And this team just began to struggle and wilt. And then the offense, after that really, really hot start, couldn't do much. And all I can compare... And then the second half, they come out and they hold the Reds... I know it's Mark Sanchez. Let's not play them down too much. All right? Then the second half, they gave up 36 total yards in one half to the Redskins. Now, I know the Redskins were literally running a Tech Mobile offense of four play calls. I put it on Twitter. And I know that they gave up 56 to the Giants without Saquon Barkley. It's hardly the most bragging thing in the world. I wouldn't go flex it. But, I mean, there's, there's a trend there. That the first half is so bad and the second half is so... Can we not meet in the middle? Can we not just find a way to have this perfectly lined up so they're a bang average defence that gives the offence a chance of doing something with the ball? It is literally like being in some sort of romantic scenario because it's cuffing season, right? We've got to get all soppy on you lot eventually. We've got to get you Eagles fans all cuffed up and I want to take responsibility for it because you've been inspired by my podcast to go and chase the love of your life or alternatively just go and order a Domino's pizza because I, I would do the same at this point. But it is like being in a scenario where you, you're giving everything, you're trying, it's just not working, everything's gone a bit wrong, and you're like, right, okay, we're going to leave that now. We're just going to gonna let that settle. I'm going to go do my own thing. And the minute you turn away, they just come sprinting back. The minute you stop trying, they just come running through, and you're like, all right, fine, we'll go again. And then it's all great for a half. Uh, and then the next game comes, and it happens again. I, I don't understand it. I, I really don't understand How the defense can go from being so bad to so good so quickly and then back again. And if it takes a half-time adjustment, just make them during the game. Surely, like, I, I obviously I lack play calling knowledge. I don't know the ins and outs of schematics. But when you're on the sideline and the offense is on the field, surely it's not hard to get the boys together and just say, right, you stop doing that. We're going to play this from now on because the offense is presenting us with this look. I just don't understand. It's literally, again, like the equivalent of leaving your homework to the last second, getting told you'll get a detention for it, then rushing it and getting an A star. What's the point? Just do the homework, don't put yourself through the stress, and it'll be fine. Instead of just like going all or nothing in LA, just meet in the middle. It's, It's not hard. But somehow, Jim Schwartz just loves playing with our hearts, loves playing a bit hard to get, And this Eagles defense then gives up 36 yards, 14 of them rushing yards. Now, again, I know that whatever Mark Sanchez was doing just wasn't working at all. And I know that it was Mark Sanchez, so the bar was unbearably low because of, obviously, what we're bound to expect from that. And Eli Manning and the Giants, I I can see why there's hesitation. I really don't think the Cowboys are going to give it to the Eagles that easily. But it wouldn't surprise me again if they come out they lay a stonker in the first half. And then in the second half, just come out and actually maybe get an interception. Maybe force a fumble. Maybe force a safety. Could be a number of things. But just one big play that they were like physically unable to do 20 minutes ago. I, I really do want to dig into the tape with this. Because last week, it was really interesting to see what Schwartz changed. And how he aided the cornerbacks. And gave them some help over the top. And just kind of shared that responsibility. Gave them less responsibility. 
when at the line of scrimmage. Instead of having to worry about two or three different players coming out of the backfield, just keeping your eye on your man outside, letting the linebackers do the rest. I don't know if the same applied last night, but the pass rush was great. Craven LeBlanc had one hell of a game, I've got to say, for a man that is, I mean, you know, I think he was great during his time before the Eagles. It unfortunately didn't pan out with his former team, who conveniently enough was the Chicago Bears, but as a nickel corner, he was really strong. I even remember watching a few of his um, games back at FAU, and there I thought, you know what, he's got the size, he's got that kind of agility about him, he's very light on his feet. I think we're beginning to see that now. He's playing with that swagger because he knows that this is an opportunity he may not get again. But as for the rest of the defence, I just don't understand how, when watching it, at least at face value on the broadcast, can go from being that good to that bad, then back to being good, then it's like flipping an egg. I don't know, who flips eggs, right? But whether the shorts can ever find a middle ground again, I don't know, because I thought he did that brilliantly uh, in 2017. The, the reason the Eagles' defence was so good was that they had a nice balance between aggressiveness and conservativeness on the outside. He noted in 2016 that the corners were being blasted down the field over and over again. They gave up more deep passes than any other team in the league. So they moved them into off coverage. That allowed Jalen Mills and Ronald Darby then at the time to begin making those tackles. To let the play come to them, give them less to worry about and make a play on the ball. And from there, that's then developed into sticks coverage. It's developed into being way too conservative on third and long, or even second and long, or anything at this point. And then it will suddenly change back to old school Jim Schwartz, where he's got a three-man rush. They're dominating up front. The linebackers are doing well. And Nate Jerry gets an interception that's then spoken over by a very well-spoken, but very mistimed and overdrawn um, speech on domestic violence. Now, again, I'm not going to nitpick at the broadcast. We all know the Monday Night Football broadcast is uh, a huge work in progress. But with something like that, you've got a huge game-changing play. You can easily pause yourself, speak what's happening, and then come back to it. I've done sports commentary before. Um, I used to do motorsport on television over here in the UK, um, sort of like GT and sports car racing. You get constant flows of information. You have to cut yourself off or cut a conversation to update you know, the fans what's going on, on in the track. It's not a difficult thing to do. It's a well-known practice. You've got to be able to have that almost multi-dimensional listening and to still talk while someone's jabbering in your ear. It's very difficult to do, but they're, they're paying millions of dollars to do it. And I feel that should have been paused and maybe readdressed after the advert break or even just given a segment post-game or something where they can really dedicate full attention to it instead of just raveling it in there where it was a little bit out of context when you've got something. But that's a different argument. That is a different argument. My point was that the Eagles' defense just keeps flip-flopping and something eventually has got to change. But we're going to move on to our final topic of the day. Again, this is only a shorter podcast. We're going to have the full-blown uh, 40 to 45-minute one next week. Well, Friday. And I mean, that, aren't you guys getting too much content? You're getting two podcasts, a film room, another Madden video. That's four videos this week. Like, we are grinding this YouTube channel on top of the articles, on top of my second job. We're, we're going in, like, to end 2018. We are going absolutely in to try and make this the best ending possible. So another aspect, and this kind of ties back to the whole Carson Wentz thing, was that two weeks ago, there was a lot of criticism for Mike Groh in the role of Golden Tate. And my response was, it's not on Mike Groh's shoulders. Ease up a bit, relax, it's not the end of the world, it was always going to take time, especially when the receiver himself is actually saying it. I don't think, looking at last night's game, anybody can view that 7 reception, 85 yard touchdown performance as a, a lack of a role. Tate, I believe, will still be in force fed, the same with Zach Ertz, and that really does suck for old Sean Jeffrey. Um, one of our writers, Morgan Burkett, wrote a, a great article on how this trade has really negatively impacted a receiver who the Eagles are paying through the roof for, for his services long term. But Tate got more of a role, he was more varied. I mean, for context, in week 12, I think he ran two routes, or three routes that ran more than 10 yards, he caught one one pass. One was a comeback. One was, I believe, it was a dig. Another a post. This time he had a slant catch and go. 
He had a couple of other different sort of routes in there. But he had two out of the backfield. And three just aiming for the sidelines. They're using him differently. And if you get Tate on the sideline, that kind of means you're going to have one receiver outside moving in. You want to trust Olshon Jeffrey inside? You want to trust Zach Ertz moving outside maybe if you're going to focus the attention that way? This was always going to take time. And as I mentioned, I've done it in a video. I've done it on the podcast where you have got so much going on. You've got so many chefs in that kitchen that it was always bound to be difficult to implement Golden Tate. It was never going to be a case of dropping him in and let him run whatever route he wants because there's so much more to a football team than that. It's the chemistry with the coordinator, with the quarterback. I know understanding strengths and weaknesses should be done way beforehand, but in terms of schematics, maybe he's not as good scheme-wise as he thought he may be. Or maybe he's better in other areas. Maybe the yards after the catch, you you can't bank on him getting them out of the backfield. Like he used to in Detroit. I mean, I remember one of the most worrying... There were two really worrying uh, pass charts that I saw for Golden Tate. There was one in week four of 2018 where everything went down that right-hand side. There was another one in week eight where everything was mesh and slants across the middle. Like everything. The Eagles are shaking it up. They're trying to find out what works and what doesn't. Because I think Tate has got way more to offer than just being a yak king. Like, what does that mean? Like, he runs fast when the ball's in his hands. Brilliant. So does every receiver. I know Tate does it very well. He's like a running back that can catch the ball. But he's got deep speed. He's got verticality. He's got physicality. He's aggressive at the point of the catch. And he can burn corners on double moves. Why would you not try and exploit those things? And you can see that's what the Eagles are trying to do now. They're trying to really ramp up the the intensity of Golden Tate's inclusion. And all it took was just patience. Again, two or three weeks ago, people were calling for Mike Groh's head. And now Frank Reich has one bad game. John DeFilippo has one bad game. And every Eagles fan's laughing like, ah, we all thought it was because of these guys. The NFL is a 16-game season. One game doesn't shape it. One decision doesn't shape it. It's a process. Teams evolve every week. Just look at Josh Adams. That is the perfect example I can think of right now. Okay, there's someone that at the start of the season was battling injury. Very, very rarely used. Because, obviously, you had Jay Jai then their injuries. But they were so intent on using the other running backs there. Of using Corey Clement, using Wendell Small. And it wasn't working. They were trying to persist with it. So he's gone from getting four carries to nine, to seven, to seven, to 22, to 20. If you were to spike that on a graph, do you imagine what that would look like? In his last two games, he's had 169 yards. He hasn't had a longest run of less than 18 yards since the loss to Carolina. The Eagles are pounding the rock. They found a different way to run their offense. And when you can run the ball that well, you open up so much more. Because the play action's going to open up. And where was Golden Tate used last night? I mean, it's a rhetorical one. I'll let you figure it out. But this Eagles team have began to diversify again. They're not slinging... Okay, they are still kind of slinging everything to us. But a lot less so. They're beginning to trust the ball outside a bit more, to move it around, opening up the run. Not afraid to run it on third and five. Although I really don't understand that goal line decision, like, at all. That was, I know there was a missed assignment on the offensive front. Jason Kelsey called it a miscommunication. But your fourth and goal at the one, or the two, I believe it was. And I don't know what that decision was to try and give it to Josh Adams out of a shotgun. I really, really don't. If I'm in that spot, I would much rather, by time, throw a pass and rely on an old Sean Jeffrey fade or a receiver to get separation. Or at least trick the run. Or you've got Carson Wentz, quarterback sneak. Like, it's been done before. I don't get that play call. There are a few questionable calls in that game. The Jim Schwartz prevent defense thing still irks. I think every Eagles fan, they get PTSD every time they see it because of Corey Graham. But it is just one of those things. That you've kind of got to come to accepting. Alright, well, this is how they're playing now. It'll be very interesting to see if that defence, on a a different tangent slightly here, retains that same structure, that same game plan, next year, when there aren't injuries. 
Like, how is this defense going to fare when you've got Rodney McLeod back there? When you've got a full cornerback corps? What that's going to look like, I have no idea. But you're going to have a full cornerback corps of some kind. Be very, very interesting. I'll leave that with you. Do you think this defense, if Schwartz does retain his job, which I'm sure he will, how is it going to change? Will it stay the same? Will they end this season and go, all right, that was great. Let's do that again. Because if they do, I think next season will be the year that Jim Schwartz would come under severe pressure from not just uh, the external side of things, but the internal as well. But that's where we're going to leave it for today. This is where we'd normally hit the thank you next section of the show. We're going to have a lot more analysis coming on this channel. I'm trying to streamline it so we don't spoil it because we have got a film room video coming tomorrow. That's Tuesday. No, Wednesday. Sorry, if you're listening to this on Tuesday. Oh, this is a mess, isn't it? There's a film room on Wednesday. You're going to have another Madden video, I believe, hopefully Thursday or Friday. And then another Outside Insider podcast on Friday or Saturday as well. So if you are new around here, guys, make sure you're smacking that subscribe button, slamming it down, spiking it, whatever you want to say. Just get the cursor on it, get your finger on it, tap it, smash it, lick it. Don't do that. But just get subscribed because we need your help and I'm so, so grateful for the support you've given me this year. I'm still saving the big emotional speech. You're not getting that one just yet. But thank you for listening to The Outside Inside. You can follow me on Twitter at LiamJenkins21 and I'll see you next time.